This is Deborah Atkinson, and you are listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top questions and struggles. I share what to eat, how to move, and how to think to get the energy and the vitality you want in the second and better half. And today we're talking about something that's a little, little bit more serious. Certainly, you don't necessarily want to define you or have something you be you come up against in your life, but it just could. And I am bringing a friend of mine who we just shared some time at a conference, very small conference of a intimate group of people. And you somehow just end up sitting next to the right people. Palmer Kippola is an author, a speaker, and functional medicine certified health coach who specializes in helping people reverse and prevent autoimmune conditions. She developed a framework called FITS, and that is F-I-G-H-T-S, to help others beat autoimmune conditions based on her 26-year battle to overcome multiple sclerosis. Her new Amazon best-selling book just released this past spring is Beat Autoimmune, The Six Keys to Reverse Your Condition and Reclaim Your Health, with a foreword by none other than Mark Hyman. In it, she shares the science, stories, and strategies to help people heal and thrive. Palmer has done coursework with the Institute for Functional Medicine the Heart Math Institute, and the Functional Medicine Coaching Academy. In addition, she studied under leading experts in nutrition, holistic health, energy, and functional medicine. She founded Transcend Autoimmune, a growing Facebook community of people proactively seeking to reverse or prevent autoimmune conditions naturally. Palmer, thanks so much for being here. Deborah, welcome. I'm so thrilled to be here. It's an honor to be on your show. I absolutely love it. Well, I have to let everybody know that I already knew I liked her before we actually started talking because she had a name tag sitting on her table. And my stepfather's last name is Palmer. And I swore if I ever had a girl, that would be her name. So I'm like, it's destiny. I'm supposed to meet you. (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. And you just had this radiant smile. So I was drawn to you too. (laughs) <laughs> well, I, I want to unpack something right away before we even dive into questions and, and a little bit about your history, with which I captured in our very short time since we've known each other. But this last sentence is really powerful, and I do not want it to escape listeners. Proactively seeking to reverse or prevent autoimmune conditions naturally. I mean, that's really empowering when you think of it this way. So reverse, and I think a lot of people think I've got this, and maybe that this defines me. Talk about that a minute. Absolutely. When I hear you say that out loud, and when I introduce myself to people as someone who used to have MS, they just stop Mm -hmm. and do a double take and say, what? I I didn't know it was possible Mm -hmm. to reverse or beat an autoimmune condition because my doctor or my specialist told me that I'll have this forever and that the best I can do is just manage it. So I just want to put a very fine point on this, that that is last century thinking. We now have the science that shows how we can actually reverse and completely heal from these previously thought of as irreversible or incurable conditions. And I'm not saying I'm not talking about putting something in remission. To me, when you hear somebody say, oh, I have something and it's in remission, that means it's lurking in the background, ready to spring forth and come out again. I'm talking about the fact that we will always have the genes for something. That's our blueprint. That is the foundation. But whether or not those genes get expressed, that's part of this new science called epigenetics I'll talk about. So good. And, and I think so important and no doubt a part of your healing and what you profess, but I think listeners, we can't drive this one home enough, the way you think and the way you language, especially inside what you're telling yourself is really important. So Palmer, let's hear a little bit more about your story. You 
were diagnosed with MS at 19. And you dealt with an awful on again, off again symptoms for more than two decades. Take us back to that first day and tell us about a gift you received while you were lying on the couch that summer. Oh, thinking back, yes, I have to take you back in time a little bit uh, to when I was 19. I was a happy, healthy, well-adjusted young woman, and I had just finished my freshman year of college. I went home for the summer, and I was working a summer job as a hostess in a restaurant, and life was good. Um, one morning, I got up to go to work, and the soles of my feet were completely tingling, like I had slept on a limb funny and the blood rushed back, only I couldn't get the blood flowing back and I would shake my feet and nothing happened. And I thought, oh, it'll just go away. But over the course of the morning, that tingling started creeping up my legs like a vine. And by the time it reached my knees, I knew something was really wrong. It wasn't going away. So I called my parents who called the family doctor who said, get her to the neurologist at UCLA. So that afternoon, we were in the neurologist's office. And uh, it was a very short five-minute visit. She had me do a few quick exams, like the heel-toe, heel-toe walking with your eyes closed and touch your finger to your nose and test the reflexes. And after only about five minutes, she pronounced, I'm 99% certain that you have multiple sclerosis, MS. And if I'm right, there's nothing you can do except take medication. And later I learned from my parents, uh, much later, that she had told them, you better prepare for her life in a wheelchair. Now, this was before the internet. We had never heard of MS, multiple sclerosis. We left her in her office with very little information and very little hope. And by the time we got home that night, the tingling had risen to my shoulders and um, by the time I went to bed that night, all of the parts of my body, basically neck down that had been tingling, went completely numb. And I would stay numb for a full six weeks. It was an absolutely terrifying time, Deborah. Um, but I will say, <laughs> I, I can't emphasize that enough. We were really scared. We had no information. We did not know what this thing was. But I um, am so grateful that my parents were rocks. My mom was super quick, quick to empathize and plan with me whatever we could plan. Like we had no idea what this future would present. And my dad was super quick to motivate my can do attitude. And he would say, Honey, I believe in you. You can beat this thing. Um, I would just obviously need to figure out how, but I had ample time to just lie there because I was literally relegated to the couch for six weeks. And, um, that couch was an important place because friends who weren't too scared off came by to visit and brought the usual gifts like cookies and books and would watch movies with me. But this one family friend who was into things metaphysical asked me, Palmer, why do you think you got the MS? And I just, I, I was shocked. I was put off. I, I couldn't believe it. What do you mean? Why do you think I got, are you insinuating that I caused this? But I just couldn't let go of this question. I She left, but the question didn't leave me. I ended up chewing on that like a dog with a bone as I lay there on the couch. And it came to me as a flash of insight. As I lay there on the couch at age 19, and I need to take you back a little bit farther in time, because I had been adopted as a child by very loving parents at three days old. Um but my dad had been a fighter pilot and his way was invariably the right way. And he was very opinionated and judgmental and he yelled quite a bit. And my mom struggled with her weight and he didn't like the fact that she was heavy. So he would yell about her, yell at her about that. And Deborah, my earliest memory is literally me about age three, maybe four. My dad is yelling at my mom. So he's standing in the hallway yelling at her and she's behind her closed bedroom door, probably crying. And I'm standing up to my dad with my little dukes up. If you call my mommy names, I'll sock your lights out or something to that effect. And I realized as I lay there on the couch, I had oh become gosh. a child warrior. I had become completely hypervigilant. 
I even endured periods of insomnia as a child. I was always scanning the environment for safety. I was locked in this chronic stress response. So that initial hypothesis I had for why I got the MS was chronic stress. And I learned many years later that that is actually a pretty accurate hypothesis because now we have research that shows that these adverse childhood experiences known as ACEs are profoundly connected to developing autoimmune conditions later in life, even decades later. So while that still rings true for me today, I do know there's more to the story. But just to close out this this phase of things, um, I was extremely fortunate that the numbness retreated enough for me to go back to school in September. And that was the beginning of my 26-year journey with relapsing remitting MS. What a story. Okay, I have so many questions here, but I do know you tried a number of experiments over the years, and some of which, you know, big experiments led to becoming MS free in 2010. So I've got questions about what were those experiments and how soon did you start experimenting on you yourself know, it's, and exploring it's interesting. options? I think when I was lying on the couch, Deborah, and after I had that insight that chronic stress was the cause. I started doing visualizations and it was really rudimentary at the time. So if you remember Pac-Man, those little men that went around eating bad things, I had these images that I held in my head of good versus evil fighting like the bad guys. So I would hold those images and imagining that my body was healed. And I, I didn't have guidance in this. It was just something that kind of came to me intuitively But it wasn't long after I got off the couch and back to college because I started doing yoga in the late 80s and I started meditating in the early 90s. So almost immediately I began, I realized if chronic stress is at the root of this, well, what's the flip of that? It's relaxation, actively relaxing. I needed to learn how to engage that relaxation response because I was always on. I was stuck in the always on position. And as you know, that is what the immune system is doing in the autoimmune attack. It's an overactive immune system. So I not only needed to learn how to relax just to calm down and sleep through the night, but I needed to train my immune system not to over or hyper react to every little thing. So that was the first thing I did was the stress reduction. And I can I can keep going on this. Yes, yoga, yoga and meditation. So I noticed stress reduction was the first experiment. And the more I did it, the fewer exacerbations I had. And I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt you because I just want to remind everybody and take you back in time because I mean this is 2019 to say yoga and meditation doesn't really strike you as odd today. But if we go back 20 years, I mean, few people were doing it, right? It wasn't so mainstream. So just (laughs) listeners kind of take yourself back to what were you doing 20 years ago, right? When you wanted to reduce stress and and think about the difference. Well, thank, thank you for was shining doing. So, that. Yeah, that what was, else um, came a after very, that? Very, very good point. Um, so th- there was a very clear cause and effect. When I was stressed with conflict at home or at school or later in the workforce, I noticed almost immediately that I would have exacerbations of the MS and develop new symptoms. And conversely, when I was relaxed, the symptoms would ebb. And so that was really, really critical that I continue doing those practices. You know, we have this automatic stress response to things, but we don't have an automatic relaxation response. So I really want to emphasize the fact that if you find yourself in this always on stress kind of mode, that we really have to be proactive to remember to relax and put it in our calendar and just start developing this as a habit because it's not going to come naturally for most of us. So that was my very big first experiment. And that worked pretty well, but nevertheless, I still had MS symptoms. So the second thing I tried, I figured diet must have something to do with this. But again, there was no internet at the time. The only thing that I had was my intuition in the library. So off I went to the library and I found the only book on MS was the Swank Diet Book. And it said that low-fat vegetarian diets were best for MS. So 
we were already low fat. I mentioned my mom was really struggling with weight. So we had margarine and non-fat milk, et cetera. Um, and all I really did is add more healthy whole grains. And I'm using air quotes with that because not only did I not notice any reduction of symptoms when I went vegetarian or vegan or macrobiotic, when I added more grains to my diet, I actually noticed more tummy trouble after eating. And I must say that for as long as I can remember, I had some tummy distress after eating, not like run to the bathroom kind of distress, but I, I've dealt with constipation for years. And my neurologist would just tell me that that's, oh, that's just a symptom of MS and to learn to live with it. But when I added more whole grains, more tummy distress. And we'll learn in a minute here why that's so. Um, I did try medication for a while. Uh, that did more harm than good. I don't need to get into details on that, but it was an experiment I tried for four years. Didn't notice any beneficial effect. And I did actually have the symptom, symptoms of a heart attack from injecting myself with this medication. So that was kind of the last straw. Um, Finally, in 2010, as you alluded to, um, I figured that diet must have something to do with this. And by now we had the internet and I thought I just need to go find a nutritionist. So I found a functional medicine nutritionist. Functional medicine, as I'm sure your listeners know, is all about getting to the root cause of things. So instead of just treating the symptoms, she wanted to run tests to find out what's really going on here. And it, it turned out that I had non-celiac gluten sensitivity. In other words, I didn't have celiac disease, but I was highly sensitive to gluten. And it turns out, Deborah, that at every meal for my entire life, I have baby pictures of me with my arm up to my shoulder in a box of Cheerios. Um, I had cereal for breakfast, sandwiches for lunch, maybe pasta, pizza, bread for dinner, right? soy sauce. We just don't know, but I had no idea what this was doing to my gut. So this nutritionist educated me on the perils of gluten, how that was inflaming my gut, creating a leaky gut. And she led me through this gut healing journey. And within one week of removing the gluten, I stopped having tummy trouble after eating, which I finally noticed and said, huh, to my husband, I feel good. And within one month of removing the gluten, I stopped having any and all MS symptoms <laughs> ever again. So from November 2010 to today, not a single tingling baby toe, nothing ever again. And I, I just want to be really quick to add that gluten was my linchpin trigger. It doesn't mean that I am saying to you that if you have an autoimmune disease, it's as easy as removing gluten and Eureka, you're done. I mean, everybody's different and there are categories that need to be addressed, but I had been whittling down my toxin bucket with the stress reduction. I had my mercury fillings removed. I was really proactively working on those things. So had I not been doing that, I don't know that gluten would have been the linchpin that it was, but I definitely wanted to um, say that that was my celebratory Eureka experiment. I no longer felt like I was plugged into a wall 24 7. And later I had lab tests which confirmed Cyrex has a lab called 7X, which is neurological tissue. And it shows whether or not you have elevated antibodies, which is a sign that your own immune system is attacking your myelin sheath and other neurological antibodies, uh, tissues rather. Uh, and that I, all of the antibodies were in the normal range, which meant no MS attack. And then eight years later, just last year, I had a follow-up MRI with my neurologist, and it came back showing that the lesions had faded or completely disappeared, which caused him to say, Palmer, this couldn't be a better story. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. That's profound. And and I want to, just for listeners, so even even without the face of a disease or a diagnosis in front of you, it, gluten can be so much more than a fad. And I think there's the, always that conflict for my listeners. And, you know, is this really a thing or I'm not celiac and, and we're, we're reading so much about the fact that, oh, this is just, you know, something that you don't have to do. It's just kind of crazy. It's been a fad. And yet, you know, similar to you, I had um, a profound difference in my 30s and 40s 
you know, I, it dawned on me that, you know, my gut challenges um, when I was exercising and training, I was running and um, I would always get stricken with like mid run, I would be doubled over and I would have to like come to a creeping walk just to get home without like it losing it, you know, and needing to find bathroom somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Um, but what happens, right, with runners, or you're you're told, you know, more carbohydrates and of course the carbs that you're given if you're doing a race or pasta and again bread and all, all of it. And as soon as I learned more about gluten and wheat and cut it out, my stomach issues through endurance exercise are are gone no more non-existent and i too am not celiac i am just sensitive i have uh, genetic traits toward it and you know it's made a huge difference in energy and the way that i feel so i encourage everybody to look at you know their own facts and test themselves but I want to bring it back to you and exciting science. So I actually have your book right here. And um, so admittedly, I've not had a chance to read the whole thing because I think I've been traveling since you gave it to me. But I ironically, you know, I'm opening it up to like page 262, just so you know. So if you have it memorized, Palmer, there you go. Uh, you found some really exciting science that caused you to go from someone who beat MS to someone who wrote a book about beating autoimmune conditions. Absolutely. Give us well, this, a snapshot. Um, you know, I had no intention to write a book. That was not book. my aim. But after I healed, I had this feeling, Deborah, of this cognitive dissonance. You know, that feeling like you, you've been told something your whole life to be one thing, and then your experience is another, and you're wondering, huh, I don't get this. I was told I couldn't do anything about it. And yet I really did. So when I'm confused like that, I dive into the research to find things out for myself. And that's what I did. I spent my days really immersed in PubMed, which is this vast uh, database of biomedical research. And one of the biggest good news studies that I found is that mm -hmm. epigenetics really supersedes the idea of genetics. So forever, we've been told that our DNA is our destiny. But this new biology, this empowering biology called epigenetics, which literally translates as above or on top of the gene, shows that it's not our genes that are just expressing themselves in some sort of pre-programmed kind of way. In other words, at 19, I wasn't a ticking time bomb, and I was just set to go off with MS, right? It's the environment that matters most. And you pointed this out beautifully. It's what you eat. It's what you drink. It's what you think. It's what you do. It's whether you move or not. It's whether you get that extra hour of sleep or not. All of those factors are giving direction to your cells and actually the DNA, the genes within the cell as to whether or not they are expressed. So this is super empowering, and I encourage anybody to learn more about it um, who's interested to look at Bruce Lipton's magnificent book, The Biology of Belief. Uh, he showcases some of his studies that he does in there at Stanford and how he went from being a traditional cellular wow. biologist teaching school at the University of Wisconsin to really waking up to the fact that it wasn't the cells that were just bang, going off, it was the Petri dish. It was the, the, the medium, the culture medium, that is to say the environment that was giving to direction to the cell. So this is so empowering. It puts us really in the driver's seat, which is both exciting and a little unnerving because it's really consequential what you choose to do. Every moment of the day, you get to choose and you're giving direction to those cells. So that was the first thing that I found um, that was super, super exciting. And I didn't know why that wasn't front page news. And if it had been, I kind of missed it. Um, but the other piece of exciting science that I found was something called an autoimmune equation. Did you know that there's an autoimmune equation for how we develop them and therefore how we can reverse them? Well, for I don't know how many decades, scientists believed that genes play a huge part in the advent of autoimmunity. That's true. They do play a part. 
And they also knew that environmental factors play a role. And those are things like your sleep and toxins and those infections and food and so forth. Those are environmental factors or triggers, also known as root causes. But what no one knew was what brought those two worlds together of genes and environmental factors until Alessio Fasano and his team, who are now at Harvard Medical School, did research in the early 2000s, and they found the third element that is necessary for the autoimmune equation, and that is intestinal hyperpermeability, commonly known as a leaky gut. So what does this mean? It means there are three factors involved in developing an autoimmune condition. One is genes. The second is environmental factors. For me, they were gluten, chronic stress, mouthful of mercury, chronic Lyme, all of those things fill your toxin bucket, right? And then they also harm your gut and they make the gut leaky. And that is the gateway for autoimmune conditions to develop. And what makes the autoimmune equation so exciting is that if you flip it, you can reverse the condition, as Dr. Fasano writes, uh, by by detecting and removing your root cause triggers, healing and sealing your gut, you can arrest and reverse autoimmune disease. So this was just, to me, this just had to be out there. I couldn't believe it wasn't in a book. And at this point, it just had to come out of me. Um, I had, this gave me information as to how I healed. I had healed epigenetically. I'll always have the genes for the MS, but the genes don't have to be expressed. And I had unknowingly followed this autoimmune equation. And the bottom line is I had emptied my toxin bucket. And that's why I really wanted to help others to figure out how they can also heal and prevent their autoimmunity. So good. So good. Love that, you know, you were there, you were in it, you had it, it happened, but you still reversed it. Can't say that enough for listeners. So make sure you're hearing that. Okay. Now you offer in the book, you offer a program, um, fights, F I G H T S. So food infections, gut health, hormone balance, toxins, and stress as a comprehensive or holistic framework for healing. Can you walk us through and let's decide here, maybe let's take one at a time, go as deep as you want to, and then let's go on to the next. Cause it, clearly some of these are very related, like food and gut health. That's perfectly said. With infections. And yes, they are maybe we we'll want to start there which since is that's kind of where your journey started. They're not in the order that fights is spelled in the book because hormones are naturally last and food is naturally first. So, I will explain. Um, So let's start with food. It happens to be the highest leverage category of any that I mentioned. Now, I came up with this framework because I wanted something to be easy for people to remember. And it's all of the root causes that we can control, right? So um, I didn't include genes in this because remember, we talked about epigenetics. When you address these, you can you are really giving direction to your cells as to whether or not those genes get turned on. So let's start with food then. Um, For this book, I interviewed more than a dozen functional medicine and integrative doctors and health practitioners. And to a person, these are people who themselves reversed autoimmune conditions, not just me telling my story. This is me interviewing and including all of these people who not only healed themselves, but went on to help hundreds, if not thousands of people themselves. So this is really an exponential good news story, right? And to a person, these practitioners and doctors told me, start with food. Why? Because their patients, and in my experience and with my clients, heal about 60 to 80% just by removing those inflammatory foods. And for some lucky people, they can heal 100% just by addressing food. So when you take the foods out, take out the bad stuff first, and work on healing your gut you may get a long way down the field without having to do anything else. At the very least, you'll feel more motivation and more energy to begin to tackle other things. So let's talk about what the biggest foods are that I have found 
uh, in my research that keep coming up again wow. and again and again. And I'm going to give you the top three. So gluten just comes up again and again as the biggest baddie. I think it was 2002, the New England Journal of Medicine attributed gluten uh, to being involved with 55 different diseases. And that was back in 2002. So it turns out that, and there's more recent research that shows that gluten creates a leaky gut in anyone who eats it. And we know from the autoimmune equation that a leaky gut is the pathway to autoimmune problems. So that if you are, if you have an autoimmune condition or it runs in your family, or you believe you might, you've got mysterious symptoms, I can't recommend highly enough that you experiment with taking this out of your diet for at least 30 days and, and doing an experiment on yourself. Um, and right up there along with gluten is dairy. It turns out they kind of go hand in hand. For many people that have autoimmune issues, dairy seems to be something that people are sensitive to. And it's not the lactose in dairy. We've heard people calling themselves lactose intolerant. Well, in autoimmune issues, it turns out it's the casein. It's That's the protein that's very inflammatory uh, for many people with autoimmune issues. So again, highly, highly, highly recommend to take that out for at least 30 days. And the third biggest baddie, we don't hear about a lot in relation to autoimmune, but it's super important. And that's sugar. And I'm talking sugar in all forms, including maple syrup and honey and all of those natural sugars and fruit, fructose. It turns out, yeah, when... <laughs> Amen, amen, amen. Um, did you? Amen. 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 <laughs> got to speak that in because no, I know there's have a to lot interrupt of me, conflict um, because I can just keep going. Um, People get stirred interrupt. up when we start saying um, that. Sugar. This but was, this ahead, was so profound to me. Um, did you know that sugar interferes with your immune system from working after you eat it for up to six hours? So if you eat something with sugar, I don't care how natural you call the sugar, you eat that, your immune system isn't functioning fully. And guess what an autoimmune condition is? It's an immune system problem. So when you eat sugar, you are blocking your immune system from functioning and you don't want that. So not only are you harming your immune system, you're actually driving obesity and insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome and all of those are actually precursors or big risk factors for developing autoimmune conditions and Alzheimer's. And I know you talk about that a lot, Deborah. So um, that we are really on the same page about it. So what I strongly recommend is that people do what's called an elimination diet. Um, that's what most holistic practitioners call it. In the book, I rebrand it as a 30-day food vacation. I put a little spin on it as something positive. <laughs> right? Because you're only doing it for 30 days and you I can do anything for 30 days, but you might experiment with foods that you oh, haven't tried yeah. before and it can be quite empowering. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's so empowering. And I just, I, I, first of all, I love that you said that because I think anytime we use the word diet, everybody's uh, just alarm goes off, whether they admit it or not. And, and there's also that opportunity, the way you're painting it. And uh, by the way, flipping through that, I'm flipping through that because I love the recipes. The recipes in there are just so good. I can't wait to to do it, and which is what it should be, right? We should be excited about it. I think the benefit that comes out of sometimes doing a 30-day or a 28-day it, experiment like this is absolutely. You get to I'm so glad to hear you say that because some people get so scared to do this, thinking, "Well, there's in a nothing way I that you eat. never do well, otherwise." I eat this way. I don't eat grains. I can tolerate cat. Excuse me, sheep and goat cheese occasionally. I don't have any reaction to them, but I live in a paleo kind of world, and I don't miss anything. There are extremely healthy swaps that you can do, and people and friends that I cook for say, this is actually better than what I have, which is normally filled with sugar and so forth. So it is really and truly possible. Yep. 
So why I I have something, this is the biggest question that comes up from my listeners and my followers and readers again and again and again, as they ask me, what do I eat when I have an autoimmune condition? And I really believe that they are in the best position to figure that out for themselves. But I have developed what I call an optimal food guide for your listeners. And if they go to palmerkippola.com forward slash gift, they can download that food guide and really... I guide you through how to do this elimination phase or this food vacation so that you can really land on the most nourishing foods for you. So that is what I wanted to say about food. So let me talk about this in a way that listeners might be um, thinking, okay, so I don't have an autoimmune disease, but she said I could prevent it. So any risk in somebody who doesn't have an autoimmune condition, going through the optimal food guide, beginning to eat like this, um, do you recommend doing it temporarily or is permanently okay? Beautiful questions. Perfect. And are they missing any So to answer the first question, can anybody do this? Absolutely. Do My this, husband is going through this right now. He doesn't have an autoimmune condition, but it's really helpful when you have mysterious symptoms or you know that other people in your family have autoimmune issues and you want to get ahead of it. Um, this is a great way of uncovering these delayed food sensitivities. And I'll tell you why, because we, you've heard of allergies. It's an immediate cause and effect, like bee stings and shellfish, and you swell up and, you know, really emergency kind of situation. Whereas a delayed food sensitivity, you might not feel the cause and effect for two days. So how do you know that eggs are at the root of a problem if you don't feel an immediate effect after eating them? But when you take them out of your diet for long enough period of time, say 21, 30 days, and then you add it back in slowly, your body will let you know. You will get a loud and clear signal from your body whether or not that is okay with you. So whether or not you have any condition at all, I I think it's one of the most empowering experiments that you can ever do. So that's to answer the first question. As far as long-term, I don't recommend that... This would be called an autoimmune paleo style diet um, for a food plan is is what I want to say. Um, and I don't recommend that people stay um, as limited in their foods as, as possible. I recommend that you add whatever you can eat that's not going to burden your immune system. So take the bad stuff out that might be bad for you. For people with pain and aches, maybe that's nightshade vegetables, and maybe you need to do that long term. For me, I'm not ever going to add gluten back in. I don't miss it. I don't need it. It's just not a part of lifestyle. And so some of them you might be able to add back in with no problem. Others you might want to just let go for good. But you're the only one that knows whether something works for you or not. Fantastic. Well said. Thanks so much. So as we, I think I could talk to you all day and we could probably, we need to have you back if you're willing to unpack the rest of fights and talk about hormone balance, toxins and stress. Absolutely. I would probably be talk about each so one of those fun. for a very long time. <laughs> but um, so first I have to secure a yes from you. You will come back, correct? So, Great. So I, I always have a say the hardest thought. question and for the end. This again is harkens there, back to is my there own another question that I should ask you or just a final thought that you like to share? experts who themselves had autoimmune share. conditions and just people like you and me, um, every single person to a person viewed their illness as a gift. And that may sound really cliche, but that gift was an opportunity for each of us to wake up to who we truly are. So one thing that I would invite you, your listeners to consider is to reframe the question maybe from why is this happening to me to maybe this is happening for me and maybe to get quiet and still and reflect on the big question that I was asked many years ago when I was lying on the couch, why do you think you got the blank? Or if you're not dealing with any autoimmune condition, what part of your life could use better balance? And we don't get quiet enough. We don't get still enough. We always have some device in our hand or we're talking or whatever. But that just getting really quiet and going inward and asking those questions gently, 
I think you'll be amazed at what can come up. Fantastic. Great. And to an amazing podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Listeners, I first of all, just want to emphasize one more time, uh, Palmer's book is Beat Autoimmune. And because I know so many of you, and I, I know you, <laughs> that if you're looking for another resource, this is an excellent book. So I would definitely pick it up. And I've only flipped through it, but I can tell you that for the recipes alone, you're going to want this one. <laughs> so if you have a question, listener, that I missed, please leave it below the show link. And today's show notes will be at flipping50.com forward slash autoimmune. I love hearing from you and I'm sure Palmer would too. I'll pass it along. And if this episode was helpful, please leave a rating in iTunes and then share it with a friend. Surround yourself with a supportive community of women on the same journey. To get the most from this week's episode, check out today's show notes again at flipping50.com forward slash autoimmune, where I'll put the link to Palmer's gift for you. And um, also a link to the book um, for that. And I want to hear from you. Should we have her back? I think we had a good time. So find all the resources right here. And what are you waiting for? Let's start Flipping 50 together.